so when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is free. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. If you didn't see last week's message, it is important that you do. I'm not joking. The message I shared last week can make a difference between life and death for you. Period. It's important that you digest that message. Now, we're not done with it by any stretch of the imagination. Um, one of the things that we need to do is come back and hit it a few times. The Lord gave me two dreams before last weekend, to highlight the importance of the message. I am doing some work around it, uh, developing a, a regimen of vaccinations, if you will. This vampire, I want to make sure, is taken care of in the people who are under my spiritual care. I've dealt with it once in my ministry, it started bouncing around again, and so it's time to take it out again. Here is the essence of the message. Food does not have power over you. Unless you're living in the natural. God's people are called to live in the kingdom, the supernatural. And so we fight, and it's a fight, to live in the supernatural at a very high realm. As we live in that realm, food loses its power over us and we begin to have power over our food, which means we can, through our thanksgiving and our petitions, consecrate it for holy use. We can literally change it so that it benefits us rather than hurts us. That's where we're headed. That's the mountain that we're climbing. But we cannot begin to climb the mountain if we give up on the way. If we give food power over us, then you should probably be reading all of the articles that say these foods cause cancer and why. They'll change their opinion in about two years. It's the way it works. However, you can live in that ever-changing mindset, or you can begin to say, I want to build faith for the fact that I have power over food. I mean, I eventually want to get to the place where I've got power over the food so I can eat whatever I want without the weight gain. I am not there yet by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> I'll let you know when I get there. You'll see me over at Cherry Smash every other night, <laughs> exercising gluttony. <laughs> Okay, I probably will not get there if I think gluttony is a part of it. Okay. Um, but anyway, if you did not ingest that message, if you did not digest it, it is going to be something you're going to see. We're going to come back and touch various aspects of it. We're going to approach it from different angles because we need to, we need to, we need to put the ax to that legalism. We need to get free from it. And it's something that has to be one of the things that, just like I was talking about before, one of the things that we do is we stand for the protection of our area during the hurricane season. This has to be one of the areas where we are fighting for the sake of living in the kingdom of God. What is the issue of living in the kingdom of God? It's, it's life and death. It literally is. Especially in the age which we now live. We need to step into more and more of the authority that we have. And so the world as it gets dark is not going to be the funnest place to live unless you have found Goshen, unless you have found the kingdom. And so that's what we're doing. So today, though we are back in the book of John, I am going to uh, finish up chapter 4 in the book of John so that we have an opportunity to grow a little bit more in our understanding of the book of John. We're doing our expository teaching through it, and today's message um, is interesting because it starts out where it's kind of confusing. When you first read it, you go, why is John saying that, and why does Jesus seem to be having such an edge to what he's saying? 
And the point is simply this. Do you love the truth or not? That's the essence of today's message. Do you love the truth or not? And if you do love the truth, it's going to have some bearing on how you live your life, literally. How important is it to love the truth? It's very important. So today, John chapter 4, verses 43 to 44, loving the truth. We are going to start with verse 43. First of all, put ourselves back into the context. What has just happened? Jesus has just had the encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well near Sychar, Jacob's well. He has just had an opportunity to be able to speak into a woman's life with a word of knowledge, and suddenly her heart opens up, and the heart of the, her town opens up. And they receive Jesus saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said, it's because we've heard him ourselves. They were a demonstration of people who loved the truth. They were able to receive it even from one of the hated Jews that showed up in their community. But they loved the truth so much they recognized it. And so they received Jesus. Okay, now after Jesus stays a couple days, it says, after two days, he left for Galilee. He stayed with them a couple of days. So after the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. As you look at that, you think, what is that talking about? He's not in his own country. He's in Samaria. He's on his way to his own country. And if you look at the account which is recorded there, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, it seems like things are going pretty well. He's just come from Judea, which really isn't his own country because he grew up in Nazareth, his own hometown area. And so you think, why did John insert this right here? Well, first of all, he tells us a very key thought. After two days, that's all he spent in Sychar. That's all he spent with the Samaritans. And then he leaves. Now, he had a fertile mission field, so John's giving us the explanation for why Jesus is leaving. Why is Jesus leaving? Because Jesus himself said, that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now, the, uh, this taps us into something that was recorded in what is known as the Didache. The Didache is a, um, a how-to manual on how to effectively manage the Christian church. It was written either by the apostles or by those they they taught, which would be called the church fathers. When you think about the apostles, their immediate disciples were called the church fathers. That's what we call them today, looking back, the church fathers. We don't know exactly who wrote the Didache. It was a statement of apostolic practice. It's what the apostles did. It was written as a manual on how to basically manage the, uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in that era. It's a very practical book on teaching. The Didache had something to say about how long you should stay in a particular area. This is what it said. Let every apostle who comes to you be received as the Lord, but he must not remain there more than one day or two if there's a need. If he stays three days, he is a false prophet. Now that's what was taught in the early church. This is by either the apostles writing this down, their disciples certainly wrote it down because they were the church fathers, and this comes to us from either the real late um, uh, first century, uh, before, before 100 AD, or right after. Okay? So it was very early they were writing this down. If you go just a few uh, statements further to what is known as the Didache 11.8, it says, but not everyone who speaks in the Spirit is a prophet. Only he is a prophet who has the ways of the Lord. And that's talking about his methods, the way that he went around and ministered. And what that tells us is that Jesus walked in this particular practice. As an itinerant minister, he didn't stay a long time in any one particular area. He would show up and he would stay for a couple of days and then he would leave again. And the reason was is that with familiarity, the impact of what you carried was lessened. 
A prophet has no honor in his own country. Jesus was saying to the disciples, the reason we're only staying two days is because of the fact if we stay longer, they will get to be comfortable with us. They will get to be familiar with us. And as a result, they will not receive at the same level that they've been receiving right now. I mean, that's really interesting. I, I, the DDK wrote it down and said, hey, if you are uh, someone who's showing up and uh, they stay three days, they're a false prophet. Now, by the way, stay three days on your dime. You understand, Paul stayed in Ephesus and Paul stayed in Corinth for lengthy periods of time, but Paul earned his living and even supported the people that were with him in, in order to be able to stay and take care of it. So if there's a traveling itinerant minister, this is from their era, of course, we have different customs now and different ways of doing things. We do honorariums and stuff like that and pay for hotel bills and have people stay for extended conferences, that sort of thing. That's all arranged in advance. But back in that era, their custom was such that if a, a, a traveling minister showed up, a traveling apostle or a traveling prophet, and they came and they stayed, they got to your house and they liked your food. On the third day, you were supposed to kick them out as a false prophet because they're supposed to know it's time to move on. That was the method or the practice of Jesus. And so that was the way that they were supposed to do it. This particular section of Scripture demonstrates to us Jesus lived just like that. He said, after two days, and John says, because Jesus knew familiarity often diminishes impact. It's just the way it is. I mean, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, you know, think of the, the, the big name preachers today that are pastors of congregations. You know, I, you can see them on television and you can, you can see, you know, hear about everything that they do. They can travel around the world. But the truth is, is they're pastors of congregations, which means they have a local body of believers. And that local body of believers, you've heard me say this before, is the crucible from which all ministry flows. It's where we get molded by God so that we're able to step out into whatever it is that God has for us. Whether you are a leader in a congregation or whether you are someone that is being equipped in a congregation, the congregation is that place, that equipping place, that crucible, that molding and shaping through the fires of relationship that gets you into the position that God can use you as he has taught you how to die to yourself. That is the same for leaders. It is the same for um, those who are being equipped by the leaders. It's the way it is. Okay, so um, I was thinking about some of those big-name preachers going back to their local congregations, and we, it's like those of us that, you know, we read their, their comments on the Internet. We read books that they've written, and we're thinking, what pearls of wisdom. It's, we're, like, we're like that woman who said to Jesus, you know, oh, blessed is the womb that bore you. And, you know, <laughs> we're, we're like... To the people that are that powerful, you know, man, it's like um, the, the Queen of Sheba saying to Solomon, how blessed are your courtiers to hear your words of wisdom all of the time. Those courtiers were probably cracking jokes in the back. Familiarity, right? Even as wise as Solomon was. And I, but anyway, as I'm thinking about some of these guys that we think are that, that high up, these, these men and women of God that we see on television, and I'm thinking if they pastor a local church, there's still people in their congregation who show up and don't have a clue about any of that. They're just the pastor of the congregation. And that means they have to minister to their needs, just like any pastor in any congregation and they have to, the, the pastors have to suffer the slings and arrows of anonymity in their own congregation, if you will. It's just the way it works. And so I, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson, now he's got a whole pastoral staff that handles a bunch of stuff. He travels around the world more days out of the year than I can even begin to imagine. And as he travels, but he goes back home to his home congregation, and you know there are people showing up that have no clue, and they're just, you know, walking out the door and saying, good message, preacher, you know, and that type of, I mean, they're just, they're just, and then they, they just, he's just normal. Why? Because he's in that congregation. Now, if he could get up and preach a message, and that person sitting there thinks that was a nice message, someone that knows who he is is going, oh. You understand the difference? The familiarity, if you will, of the local church in that sense, but it, the familiarity lessens impact. You know, when I travel, one of the things that I do, I, yeah, this is just, and this is the way it is. You're an expert if you have a, a suitcase that you travel over 50 miles. You know. Okay. 
It's just the way it is. That familiarity that we have, and it's just, you know, why do we have conferences and stuff like that? Why do we have people come in? Because there's different ways that they look at things and all of that, but also because that familiarity isn't there yet. Sometimes they're able to turn a phrase. Sometimes they're able to say something that penetrates in a way that, you know, the, the familiarity you're no longer able to hear because of it. So anyway, it's just the way it works. So Jesus said at itinerant ministry level, he said, you know, since we can't hang around longer than what our welcome will extend itself. So, okay, just a practical thought. When it says when he arrived in Galilee... The Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. So, the majority of Jesus' public ministry had been in Judea up until this particular time. The majority of it, because he'd go there, and he'd be at the feast, and he would do different things. We know that's where he grabbed his first disciples. He came up to Cana, and he had that, the, the uh, turning water into wine. This is the first of his miracles that talked about. That was a significant event, which John will be referring to. Um, but the Galileans had seen the miracles that he had done down at the feast in Jerusalem. And as a result, um, they were very, ex- they had a lot of expectation. What did they have expectation for? Miracles. They wanted to see miracles. And uh, Jesus wasn't real happy about that because of the fact that he wanted to teach them. He wanted to share with them the ways of the kingdom of God. And they just wanted to see the spectacular and, and we'll hear that coming from him. Um, they had been there, so their expectation was for miracles, not for words of truth. Jesus was the Word incarnate. Can you imagine sitting next to him and being able to listen to the things that he said? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, just think about it. The wisdom, the life. But if, if, if all you saw him for was a miracle worker, that you were going to miss the main part of who he was. Okay, he heads up into Galilee. The Galileans are excited. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. So Cana was the scene of the first miraculous sign. And when you think about that first miraculous sign in Cana, remember how the word went out. It was a wedding feast. It went out into the area. Everyone knew about it. And as a result of this miraculous sign, his disciples put their faith in him. Remember that? Back from that story, the disciples saw the miraculous sign and they began to believe, put their faith faith in Jesus in a whole new way because they knew what had happened. They were already listening to his teaching. And then they saw the miracle which backed it up and they began to understand more about him. So while he's in Cana, a a royal official, one of the king's officials who was in Capernaum heard Um, what was going on that Jesus was in Cana, knew about the story, obviously, of the changing water into wine, perhaps already knew about his Judean ministry, and as a result, this royal official wanted to get to connect with Jesus because the royal official's son was sick. Um, Later on, here it talks about him as a son, which is an heir, however, a male heir, Later on, he says to Jesus, my child, which puts the age group not so much here height-wise, but more down here. My child is sick. And so um, this was a younger man who was sick, uh, a child, and the man heard that Jesus was there, and he went and he begged him. Now, the Greek language here is he's repeatedly begging him. It's not like he asked once. It's like he is there and he's pressing his case with Jesus. He needs Jesus to come and heal his son. He maybe asked him before he spoke a message, and then he was right up there after the message and says, I really need you to come heal my son. And then Jesus goes and has a lunch break and comes back, and this guy's right in his face again. That's kind of the picture. It isn't just a one-moment thing where this guy just comes up and says, hey, I need some help, and Jesus responds. This guy was persistent, as any parent would be, 
in order to have the child that they love taken care of. And in that era, that meant, you know, when he, this kid had a fever, a, a bad one that was about to take his life. And so he needed help. So, Jesus' response to all of this persistence is surprising to us in some ways. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. That's a little harsh, don't you think? This guy's coming because his heart is breaking. He is filled with fear that he is going to lose his little child. He is begging Jesus to intervene. And Jesus, in response, says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. And you think, man, that's a little bit hard, huh? But remember, this is the same Jesus who with the woman who was um, going down the road with him, the the, uh, um, Gentile woman going down the road with him, Syrophoenician woman, who wanted her daughter healed, um, Jesus said it's not right to give what is, you know, give the food that's intended for the children to the dogs. Jesus was not above using the circumstance that the person found them in to give them teaching and to challenge them in their faith, even if they were in desperate need. Was he fully aware of what he was going to do? Of course. However, he wanted to teach this guy and the people around him something. Jesus recognized the general condition um, of the people. When the Galileans were so excited to have him come, they weren't excited because they wanted truth. They were excited because they wanted to have some miraculous experience. They wanted to see this stuff. You know, they thought they had the truth. Remember, that was something that they were, you know, they thought they had truth. They didn't. They were deceived, but they, 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 they wanted the miraculous. In fact, later on, Jesus would do the miracles, and then he'd teach them, and they'd say, you're going to have to give us some more miracles to back that up, after he'd already done a bunch of miracles. That, I mean, just, they, they just went, they were not truth seekers. They did not naturally seek after truth. I'm going to just take a, a moment just to, just to talk about that. We need to be those who seek after truth. If we are people who only follow miracles, we're being set up for the Antichrist. If we only ever follow the anointing, and I think the anointing is a good thing, but if we only ever follow the anointing, we're setting ourselves up to be deceived by the Antichrist. You have to follow the truth. You have to go after truth truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, there's this incredible scripture where the Apostle Paul is warning about just this thing, and he could be describing the day in which we live today. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. I mean, do you see that? The coming of the lawless one. The coming of those who have Satan's purposes in mind is going to be through counterfeit signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, that means that we have to be really good at discernment, and the way that we discern what is going on is we love the truth. You know the old adage that the way that you learn to find out what a a counterfeit bill is, is you study the real thing. You handle it and you touch it so that when you touch the counterfeit, you go, that's not right. And then you're able to, you know, find out why it's not right. But it's through going after the true thing that you recognize the deception. And so just because there's miracles happening doesn't mean that we automatically commit ourselves to it. Just because someone's anointed doesn't mean we go after it. Jimmy Baker, when he wrote his book, I Was Wrong, he said that he had anointed people that would come on his show who lived like the devil behind them. And he didn't care. He wanted, the, he wanted them to be on the show talking about the anointing. His error was the fact that he, would, um, he was more interested in the, 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 the anointing than he was in the truth. He was more interested. I mean, we read the DDK already. Hey, a person can speak by the Spirit and still not have the ways of Jesus about him. If he doesn't, don't do it. Stay away from him. That was one of the basic teachings of the early church. We need to be, by their fruit, you will know them. 
And that was what Jimmy Baker trespassed on. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the works of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused. See the past tense? They refused. To love the truth. There's a certain point when our refusal to love the truth becomes we refuse to love it, past tense, and so now we're caught in deception, present tense. That's bad. They refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. That sentence should make your blood run cold. See, there's a certain point when we refuse the truth where God enters into your deception. Ooh. There's a certain point when you refuse to love the truth that God enters into your deception. It's the Pharaoh thing. When... God first spoke to Moses and said, you know what? I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. That's not how it started. He told Moses, I'll end up hardening his heart. But what happened is when Moses started to have encounters with Pharaoh and did everything, it says very clearly, it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And suddenly there's a change. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. At that point, God entered into the deception and Pharaoh was a dead man walking. His redemption was over. He had been hardened. Paul's just saying it a different way. At a certain point when we say no to the truth, at a certain point, the Apostle Paul says God sends them a powerful delusion. That is just. Is it important to love the truth? Yes. You bet it is. Then the Apostle Paul says, but we always ought to thank God for you brothers loved by the Lord because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. The work of the Holy Spirit is to set us apart for the Lord, to begin to cleanse us from unrighteousness after we've been saved, and then through believing in the truth, begin to understand the truth. Why? When you believe the truth, when you understand the truth, that's how you die to self. You see, you, have a, you, you believe in a a set of standards that God has given us. You know the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. You know that. And so as you're walking through your life, you, you know this truth, you believe this truth, and so it's you know love, joy, peace, when all of a sudden something happens that attempts to steal your peace, peace and you just are like, oh, you know, I, I, it would be, I could freak out right now, right? But you, you die to that desire... Because you go, I believe the truth. The truth is, is that God wants me to walk in peace. I am not going to walk in, in this, this freak out, in this lack of peace, in this unrest. Um, love, joy, peace, patience. I'm not going to get impatient. Although everything in me wants me to get irritated and impatient, I'm going to die to that. Why? Because I know the truth. The truth is, is that patience is more powerful than impatience. And you die to self because you know the truth. And you know it's truth. You know it's correct. The reason people choose not to live in patience is because they believe impatience accomplishes their goals more. Lack of kindness, they believe, accomplishes their goals more. You know, I, I, uh, I, I don't... I don't uh, uh, yeah, I can use this illustration. You get one shot with me at a restaurant. And if you're not kind to the waiters and waitresses, that was your last shot. If your impatience for the minor problems that might happen around a restaurant, sometimes I get irritated with waiters and waitresses because I can just see they don't care. I still tip them good. Why? Because I am going to do something contrary to what they are doing. I am going to walk in the power of the Spirit of God. I am going to do the opposite, and in so doing, keep burning coals on their head if they have truly done a substandard job out of their lack of caring for me. I am still going to love them and care for them. 
but if, if you're rude to a waiter or a waitress, if you demonstrate your impatience on a high level, if you are so demanding that it's embarrassing, that will be the last time that I can be with you in public. Because it's going to cost me a lot of money. Because I have to make up for your rudeness through the tip that I give. Literally. And apologize to the person privately. It's just the way it is. We have to be better. And the reason I believe that is I know that the Lord teaches me that my generous patience with people is going to accomplish more in the kingdom of God than my impatient stinginess. And so we have to be, you know, we have to cultivate that thing. That's truth. I'm giving you truth, and we choose to live in the truth, or we choose to live in deception. Deception is that doing it my way is going to be best, being rude and inconsiderate and a jerk. And that's just deception. And so what happens is we, we begin to follow a way that isn't true, and we end up in a mess. And the Holy Spirit is going to sanctify us through belief in the truth. It's important for us to follow after truth. And so we need to be growing in the truth. It, it used to trouble me when I would know that there were people you know, that would follow conferences and they would just go because there was an anointing and they really didn't check out what the, the teaching was of the particular conferences. I've been at conferences where the stuff taught from the front is ant the antithesis of truth. It means the opposite where you go, my goodness, this is horrendous. I've been in pastor's meetings where the guy up front that's doing the teaching says Jesus did not keep the law perfectly for us and he was applauded. Now, he didn't say it in that blunt a way. What he said was this, you know, Jesus did not have to keep the law because he authored the law. And so I believe that he was able to step outside of the law in this particular instance. And he did what the law said he was not supposed to do. Which is saying the same thing I just said. Which means he did not keep the law for us. Which means he was not our redeemer or our savior. The, that was, that's what we call heresy with a big H. Not little H. It was in a leader's meeting, and he was applauded for this deep insight. I usually don't stay much further than that. I'll, I got up, and I, I, I spoke to the one person in the room that I had relationship with, and I said, you know, if that's true, we're still in our sins, and we have no hope. Because Jesus had to keep the law perfectly for us. Have a nice day. And I walked out. And two days later, the guy texted me and said, thank you. Just two words, thank you. Took two days to get the text because he probably remembered then. But he also realized he had to chew on it and, and he did the Berean thing. He searched it out and he found out why, why did this upset Randy that much that he not only had to stop and tell me about this, but he, he didn't stay for the rest of the message because I did not want to get more frustrated. I know about patience and I know my limits. I would eventually have been standing up going, that's wrong! And that wasn't right for me to do that. You understand? That would have been an in proper thing to do because I didn't have authority in that meeting. And so in order for me not to be sitting there going, kah, kah, you know, I mean, I know when I need to leave. It just, it, it, we need to go after the truth. I mean, it's just, it's, the truth is important if we don't want to be led into deception. You see, by the way, if Jesus didn't have to keep the law perfectly, then why do you have to live in God's word and will? Can't you take shortcuts if you're an anointed leader, man or woman of God? And the answer is, no, you can't take shortcuts. Jesus did not take shortcuts. He lived perfectly for us, and we need to live in his will to evidence the power of the kingdom around us. Now, I'm not... I'm not saying that that earns us anything. It does not. It's a demonstration of the fact that we're walking in the power of the kingdom. It's how our discernment is able to see. If there are people who are walking in the power and the, what appears to be the power and authority of God, and yet they're living outside of the truth, you, don't, you know where that anointing comes from. And you know there's more than one anointing. You do know that, right? Anointings come from both sides. And if we don't, but guess what? They feel the same. 
Because it's just supernatural power. Supernatural power coming from a supernatural realm feels the same no matter if it is from God's side of the realm or Satan's side of the realm. He created Satan. Satan was in his realm before he threw him out of heaven. That's why, I mean, I, <laughs> I remember a, a theological professor after he had come to understand more fully the ways of the kingdom of God, saying that when he taught against the kingdom, he felt the anointing. Teaching against the kingdom of God, he felt the anointing. It was only after he got to know the truth that he understood that the anointing that he felt was not God's anointing. He was being anointed from a different source. We have to be extremely careful about this whole pursuing the truth thing, which is why Jesus, this man, comes to him. I mean, he got this father who is saying, Lord, help my son. And Jesus is more interested in talking about the truth than he is about carrying on with the request at hand. Come down before my child dies. The guy, you know, Jesus, you know, Jesus says, unless you guys see miraculous signs, you'll never believe. You need to believe the truth. You need to pursue God for truth. And the guy listens to Jesus saying that. And you know, I, you and I would be the same thing as this guy, right? Yeah, that's fine, Lord. Heal my son. You know, he just gets right back in his face. Because this is a persistent father. He, he loved his child. And of course, like any of us would. He says, great, I love your theological discussion. Heal my son. Okay? Come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, you may go your son will live. Okay? Now, here's what happened. Remember the centurion? The centurion, one of the guys that was described as great faith along with the Syrophoenician woman. Both of them pagans. Both of them at least grew up in pagan, um, you know, they grew up in pagan cultures. They grew up, the, the, the systems that, as I often mention, the, the uh, gods that they grew up with were capricious and mean and spiteful and vengeful. If you believed in di divinity after, or deity after, you grew up in those settings, you were, you know, it's difficult. It was just difficult what they believed about divinity and deity um, because of what they were taught growing up about the capriciousness of the gods. And so all of a sudden, they come to understand the God of Israel a little bit more, and they're, they're living way outside of their experience of God. And Jesus says to this centurion, the centurion says, hey, I have a servant, he's sick, need your help. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to come. Centurion says, don't come. You don't need to come. I understand authority. I say a word, my servants go do it for me in other areas. You just say the word, your servants will do, take care of it for you. You, know, you have authority in the heavenly realms. And Jesus says, man, that's great faith because he's, he's living way outside of his experience of God. Now, we've got this issue where the guy is saying, come down, come down before my child dies. And all of a sudden, Jesus does something in the, to this guy that is amazing in some sense. He says, you may go, your son will live. This guy's been in his face. Their theology and understanding up until that particular time was simply that you had to come and lay hands on people. So what Jesus was doing was a whole paradigm shift for this guy. It, this royal official was saying, you got to come to Capernaum and lay hands on my kid. And Jesus said, no, you can go. He's fine. Had a moment of decision, didn't he? Think about it. His whole paradigm is that you have to come and lay hands. And it says, the man took Jesus at his word and he departed. The man believed Jesus. In fact, he double believed Jesus before the sign was released. It was an amazing point because Jesus had said, unless you see miracles, you'll never believe. And then John shows us a man who believed before he saw the miracles. See the shift? Jesus says to the general populace, unless you people see miracles, you'll never believe. And then he says to this man, because he's looking for a truth seeker, even in his desperate need, and he's looking at this man and he's saying, go, he's healed, 
and the man believed without seeing. Blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. That's that. This guy. By the way, Jesus doesn't say he had great faith. You know why? He was probably Jewish. He should have known this could happen. That was just faith for someone who grew up in Judaism. He would have to have been a pagan centurion or Syrophoenician woman for it to be great faith. For him, because he was Jewish, he should have known this. So Jesus doesn't call it great faith. It's just for a Jewish, Jewish guy, faith, you know. So, what happened? While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed. That's pretty good. His care, by the way, he, he runs into the servant. You, get, you got this. He's on his way. It's, it's taking some time to get back home. He's, he's going, and uh, while he's still on his way, his servants come, and uh, they say, the boy's fine. And he says, huh, we need to find out when this happened, because the boy had a high fever. When did his fever break? And it was at the exact hour. That was enough for this guy. He knew. When Jesus said, go, your son's going to be fine, the fever broke right then. This guy did his careful investigation. He was looking for truth. And as a result of what he found out, he responds to Jesus. So he and all his household believed. That's pretty impressive. This was a guy, I mean, Jesus would run into things in his ministry where he would do impressive, miraculous signs and when he got that, he started talking truth to the people. They'd want more miraculous signs. This guy believed in Jesus' truth, had a miraculous sign that caused him to believe, but he, he didn't need any more. He was, he was there. That's pretty powerful, his response to Jesus. John was pretty impressed with it. He said, this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed having come from Judea to Galilee. Now, what does that mean? This is, by the way, I believe the last time it talks about the number of miraculous signs. Remember the first one in Cana? The first one was it brought the disciples to faith. This second one brought a royal official and his whole family to faith. And so when John talks about a miraculous sign, it's really a miraculous sign with effect. Because Jesus was doing all sorts of miraculous signs. But this is the second miraculous sign with effect of having the people entrust themselves to Jesus that took place when Jesus came from Judea to Galilee. First one, of course, changing the water into wine. The second one also resulted in faith here. This story is important. Jesus went out of his way to make sure we understood that it's important. It's important that we be truth seekers. Why am I going after this thing about food? Well, it's because the Lord directed me to it with two dreams, two nights in a row, so that I would make sure that I went after it. I mean, I'm not doing it because I suddenly decided this was a good topic. I was hoping it was dead and gone when I go after this whole thing about giving power to other things in your life instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going after this thing because we need to know truth. We need to know truth. We need to climb that mountain of experience so that we are able to step into the power of the kingdom of God. We need to begin to live at a higher level than we've ever lived before, but that's only going to happen when we begin to live in the truth. Here's the problem. When the entire world is telling you that your belief system is wrong, it's difficult, isn't it? Welcome to the kingdom of God. That's why the Lord's gracious with us, is he not? We need to live according to the truth, not according to our experience, not according to our natural experience and the ever-changing opinions of doctors and medical profession and dietitians. We need to live in the truth. And if we don't live in the truth, then we're just going to be swayed back and forth by every, every wave of deceitful teaching. It's just the way it is. Have you figured out yet that the pharmaceutical companies aren't necessarily your friends? 
You know, they've got those guys showing up at your doctor's office to try to get them to get you onto their particular drug without caring whether it's the best thing for you. They want to make sales. I just read an article this week about that doctor. I think it was in Kansas. He was sentenced to 30-some years because they, they, you know, he was doing pain medications. But there were things that he was being told by the... Um, salesman that the drug had nothing to do with. I mean, it was like there was no evidence that what the salesman was telling the doctor was true, and the doctor, it actually killed people. And that's why the doctor ended up in jail for 33 years. As a, a, a pill pusher, or a, you know, whatever they call those uh, pill mills. But uh, it, it, it's, you understand, whenever there's a profit motive, you've got to be well aware of the fact that they're not necessarily your friends. They're not necessarily your enemies either. They're people trying to do something that is their line of business to help people, but along the way, they're just people. And they have a bottom line that they have to meet. And you better love the truth. Because if you don't love the truth, you can enter into deception in a moment. We need to live in truth. Another way of saying it is we have to live by principle, not expedience. We have to live principially. We have to live in a way that we recognize this is God's truth. This is where I'm going to live no matter what comes against it. Do you know there are people dying right now in Iraq because they're living principally? They're, they're living according to the truth and they're not loving their lives so much as to shrink from death. They are saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live according to what I believe is truth. And if it costs me my life, that's okay. Unless you believe in truth, you just can't go there. I mean, people can be deceived too. You can enter into a heavy-duty deception and live like that. But if you start as a truth seeker, if you're really purposely after truth, Romans chapter 1 is pretty clear. It says that if we will honor God, if we will glorify the Creator, if we will do that, God will make certain that He begins to communicate with us. That's, it, it takes the Holy Spirit to respond to the Creator at any level. And if we don't, read Romans 1, God hands them over. Well, you're describing our culture right now if you read Romans chapter 1. And we end up serving the created rather than the creator. All because the truth is inconvenient. It's important for us to go after truth. The Lord's going to be challenging us. I can tell you that I can feel it already. When he went after two nights in a row to make sure that I preached last week's message, I can tell you, he's, he's on a, he's on a uh, mission. You'd expect God to be on a mission from God. Because he wants to get us into a place where we can let his light shine. We've been doing it. But we've got to go to the next level. You never stay where you are. You keep going after God. You keep climbing that mountain. So get ready to have your, cha- your beliefs challenged according to the word of God in the sense of living in the supernatural. You understand? Just we, he, he's going to challenge us. He's going to challenge you as individually. He's going to come to you in situations that I, you, know, you can't even imagine that he's going to come to. And he's going to challenge you because he wants you to break through some deceptions because he loves you and he wants to use you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity today to look at this study on the importance of truth and pursuing truth. Lord, we love the miraculous. We love the anointing. We love all of those gifts and things with you, from you. But we recognize, Lord, that we have to pursue truth more than all of those other things. Because, Jesus, you are the truth. You are the word. Your word is truth. You said that to the Father, and you are the word. So we want to pursue you. We want to pursue what you have taught us. We want to pursue what you have released to us through your word of truth so that we might be able to climb the mountains that you have given us so that we are not deceived, 
so that we do not step away from the grace and the anointing. I ask, Lord, that you'd help us today to begin to step into everything that you have for us in the realm of your kingdom. Thank you for each and every person here who is committed to truth. I ask that your life would be released. Amen.